You were raised by Master Woody, who is who is well known throughout the Muay Thai community. So, what what was that like growing up in a in a household where Muay Thai was such a important part of life? Well, we, I grew up in England. I was born in England, and uh, I grew up there until I was 14 years old. So, I mean, during my youth, I wasn't so into it. I was saying I wasn't so exposed to it. Although, my dad would have like all these different galas. Like he he he'd host fights in England, and he had a gym there, which I didn't really go to much because he also owned restaurants, Thai restaurants, and a karaoke bar. Um, but sometimes. Or I remember, I do have one vivid memory of like, he'd have these Thai fighters come to stay at our house in England. And like, we had like the the front garden, the yard, and then like, all these Thai fighters are like on the front of this. We, we lived in a very small town in England, okay? It's like very, very small. Anyway, so all these Thai fighters were there on the front garden, like shadow boxing and training. And they like, all the neighbors would come around and like watch, like what the hell is going on here? <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that, I mean, I get like little, little, uh, experiences like that throughout my my youth but um yeah i i guess i was so english at the time so, so was, yeah your father now he had a thai restaurant and the gym was upstairs i believe from what i understand that that's like one of the thaiest things that you could do right <laughs> you don't realize it when you're not in thailand but then when you come to thailand you live here like you you see like okay the gyms and the restaurants are a lot of times they're connected yeah. These, these family businesses so that yeah that is like super Thai right there yeah super so thai. when when did you start getting involved in Muay Thai like when did he start introducing you to the uh to the sport and the culture and everything I, mean, I think it was when I moved to Thailand so at yeah around age 14 he was hosting the world championships which he has been doing since like 1995 but obviously he would come to Thailand to do it you know or he'd go around the world to do seminars and then come back so like I, I was in my house in England and I, I didn't really know what was going on. He'd come up with all these photos and like gifts, but like I didn't really bother. Um, but yeah, so he did the world championships every match. And then that's when I started to see for myself, like I went to go watch and I was like, wow, like this is a big deal. You know, all these different countries, like up to 50 countries come in to uh, compete. Um, yeah, and just watching Muay Thai firsthand. And then I got, so then I just started to do it like for exercise. Wasn't really so into it. And then he did MBK Fight Night. He was promoting MBK Fight Night. And around age 18, I was helping to like do the ring girl thing. <laughs> um, and because of that, again, I got to meet more people and see like professional Muay Thai then. Like, it was kind of wild, the fights back then, because they were kind of low level, but people just went at it. They didn't care. They just wanted to fight. So I was right. like, wow, this is, this is pretty exciting. And uh, I would see some girls fight. And it was once when I saw two girls fight who were like my size. And I thought, like, I could fight them. <laughs> that was the first thing I thought, I could fight them. They're like my size. So then that was it. I told my dad, I was like, okay, I want to try and fight. And he was like, no. <laughs> I was like, well, I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's hard, hard to not want to do it when your father is so immersed in the sport, you know? Yeah, but I mean, of course, being his daughter, he don't, doesn't want to see me get hurt. Right. And um, he didn't think that I could do it. He didn't believe in me. So, you okay. You proved him wrong. Yeah, and you proved him wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. So, yeah. So, you, uh, so you were, before you moved to Thailand at 14, was that the first time you actually came to Thailand? Or how, did you travel there before? We came here, like, not every year, just a few times. And I'd just go to my family house. So I didn't really see much of Thailand, to be honest. I just went to the family house and then they'd take us around. So I had no idea where we were going. And that was it, not much exposure. So yeah, at 14 years old, you know, you're in your, you're at, you're at that age where you kind of want to be with your friends and stuff like that. So what is it like to have to uplift, up, uproot yourself from a place like the UK and actually move to Thailand? Completely different cultures, different atmospheres, different climates, everything about it. You know, how did that how did that affect you? Difficult. It was very difficult. Um, I went to international school when I first moved here, which again is not even like Thailand. That's just like a, a, its own world in itself. Um, all these kind of you know well-off kids at this international school, and I was from like not like on the outskirts of Manchester, so it wasn't like the nicest place. 
So going to, uh, I actually went to Bangkok Patina School, which is a very good school here in Bangkok. And I just thought, this is weird. So like, everyone has a weird American accent, which I didn't understand. They didn't understand my accent either at the time. It was, it was much broader. Um, it, yeah, it took some time to, um, to sort of find my place. I guess. And I think yeah, so in that school, I didn't find my place yet. Yeah, that's a, it's interesting because you figured at Bangkok Patana, there would be more UK sounding students there, but you're saying there was more American students. Well, yeah, at the time it sounded American, but now ah. I know it's the international accent. Ah, okay, okay. Which I think I kind of have a twang of. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, 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 so what is it like? Like the first day you show up at school, you know, what's, what's going through your head? Are people open to, to talking to you? Do, you? do you find yourself in a click right away or do you kind of have to feel it out? Like what's happening? I definitely had to feel it out. Um, pe like I said, people didn't understand me. I have such a broad accent from like a small town in, in England. So like actually a couple of kids laughed at me because they couldn't understand what I was saying. So I remember that and I just thought this is horrible. You know, and I, my school in England was rough. It was like a pretty bad school, not bad school, but yeah, the kids were not the the nicest kids you know like um just just before i left england like one of the kids stabbed another kid in the art department like that's that type of thing so that's where i came from and then i went to bangkok panama school and i was like wow everyone here is like so focused on their studies and they're so, such like good kids but like i thought i don't know they don't know the real world <laughs> right right <laughs> different than the uh it sounds like you know people who are raised on the streets, right? They're kind of street smart where Bangkok Patana is a very, probably the most prestigious school in Bangkok for, for international families and or Thai families alike, you know, but so, you know, when you, when you were back home in the UK, did you, did you have a click over there as well? Like being that you were mixed raced, what was it like growing up as a Luke Kung over there in the UK first? In England, it wasn't so bad, actually. I think um, I just became an English person and I got seen, seen as an English person. Um, I have been called chink which is fine, whatever. Or like, you know, like, you say you're Thai and they're like, Taiwanese? You're from Taiwan? Yeah, yeah. No. <laughs> no, so you get stuff like that. Um, yeah, I think my race being mixed in where I was in Manchester, it wasn't such a big deal. And there was more kids from like all over the place, like Bangladesh, Pakistan, and I had a lot of uh, mix over there. So, um, they, like, I, I guess the full kids would get more of it than I would. Yeah, like my group was most, mostly white. Uh -huh. Yeah, and then when I went to Bangkok Patina School, I think my, my group was also, again, mostly white because like, I wanted to be like, find the English people, you know, right. I wanted to find that like something relatable. Right, right, familiar. Yeah. 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 When I, I didn't realize how important appearance was in Thailand because I think it's the same thing back home. Uh, I was raised in a very diverse area. You see people from all different countries and, and all different races, religions. And when I moved here permanently and I started to understand the language and uh, we had our first daughter, obviously she's a, a Luke Krung too. I started to hear what people were saying when we were walking by. And I, I started to realize like, wow, in, uh, appearance is so important. You know, looks are so important in Thailand. Yeah. So now when, you, when you're living in some place like the UK where it's probably not as important as it is, is here. And then all of a sudden you come here and you get the Thai side of it, you know, where they're, they're very intrigued with like the Western nose or the Western features. You know, what does that do to you now when you come here and you're starting to immerse yourself in, in Thailand? When I was a kid, I was quite fat. And then when I came to Thailand, I got told I was fat. You know, yeah, they yeah. tell it to you, right, to your face. Yeah. Um, so that was one of the, the first things I was like, like, what? Like, I, you know, like, people don't say that to people in England, in the yeah. West. So I was like, what? So then that's why I got into more sports, because I was like, wow, like, maybe I am now. And then I started to compare myself to, like, the tiny Thai girls. You know, and, and at that time, 2007, Thai people were very small. Like now they've kind of got bigger. You can see because all the like the Western food influence. Um, so yeah, uh, physical appearance is a big thing. Um, I, and I think for Luk Krung, there's a lot of pressure for on, placed on Luk Krung for their physical appearance. Um, I think that if you, so my mom's English, my dad's Thai, obviously. But if you were to have a Thai mom, this is what I've heard from my other Luke Krung friends, that the Thai mom does place more pressure on the, on the daughter and how they look physically. Yeah, it's, for me, I don't really get that. Uh -huh. Yeah, the Western mom. Um, so that is one thing, yeah. Yeah, 
you could probably hear my kids in the background outside actually probably yelling right now. I'm going to have to cut that part out. But yeah, I think, yeah, I would say that's probably accurate, you know, because a lot of ties that we talk to, mostly it's the females who are always saying like, wow, you should get your kids into acting or, you know, into modeling or something like that. And I'm just like, that's, I don't want to do anything like that, you know, with my, with my daughters. Yeah. And, uh, at the schools, at least some of the more Thai, Thai schools, I think if, if there's Luke Krung in there, they kind of use their picture as this billboard on the side of the school. It's like, wow, look at us. We have a Luke Krung here. You can come to our school. And yeah. you know, those, those things kind of bother me because I, I don't want my daughters to be seen as just uh, some outside shell, you exactly. know? Exactly. So um, <clears throat> Luke Krung in Thailand, they're glorified. And they shouldn't be because we're just normal like everyone else. Right, right. And if, if you keep on doing that, it's going to fill people's heads, right, obviously. And then they're going to think, oh, then I don't need to get a normal job. I don't need to focus so much on my studies or, you know, like all these different experiences that a normal person would be like, okay, I need to do this. Uh, they'd just be like, oh, I can just be a model. And then that's not the way to think. Yeah. Right, right. So, so what are some of the things that you personally had to deal with as uh, any challenges as a Luke Krung in Thailand when you came here over the years, even, even now up until today? Um, I think, I mean, you're obviously, you're never Thai enough, but you're never Farang enough either. And it's yeah. hard to find your place. It's hard to find your group. Yeah, a lot of the Luke Krungs that I know, they are, especially the girls, are quite insecure. That's why I really focus on Muay Thai and sports because that's like that grounds me. That has made me like very confident in myself because I do like you know I used to compete, I used to fight professionally, and and I think from doing a competitive sport you know, learning to lose and then fail, you know, you, you learn to lose and then get back up and you go on to the next one. I think that um, grows a lot of self-esteem. Yeah. And now so, it's, you just mentioned about identity. Not sure if you're Thai, not sure if you're, you know, Western. Like how has that affected you as well? Have you ever felt really, really one thing at one point in your life? Because it, even when my kids, when my kids talk, they're like, you know, why do American people do this? Or why do Thai people do this? And when they say that, I'm like, I'm like, wait, you're you're also American, you're also Thai, yeah. but they talk about those those people as if they're kind of like this outside group. Yeah. They they don't realize that they're part of those, you know. So I think they're a little bit confused. They don't know which which side they're on, or, or they. And I'm worried about like if they're going to be affected by not having a national identity to stick to or or to grow up with, you know. Like, has that affected you at all? Um. Yeah, every little crunk has identity issues, I feel like. Um, for me, I kind of understand because, uh, yeah, I've lived in the West 14 years and I've lived here 14 years, exactly half, half. So um, I've, now I've be, been able to understand it a little bit more and I like to analyze and, and see things. And, and again, doing sports has helped me so much. I can't like stress like how much that has helped me. And uh, the yeah, what you just said, like they're not sure, like they, they place one group, like the Western into one group and the Asian into one group. I think that's because of their social circle. So say they're around their mum, <clears throat> then the mum's friends, they would always be like, oh, Farang is like this, Farang, Farang, Farang. And then they get that in their head. Oh yeah, so Farang is like that. Because that's how Thais see things. Right, right, you know? right. They, very, they separate everything. Right, right. And then if they're with the, I'm sure if they're with the Western group and the Western friends, then they're also going to get a different perspective on ties as well. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So now, how is uh, how is training Muay Thai and competing in Muay Thai helped you? Like, what are some of the things that 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 has helped you overcome? Aside from, you know, I know you touched on a little bit, like the the weight issue or just being able to kind of, I guess, release that stress of being, you know, this Luke Krung in Thailand. But are, are there any other ways that sports or doing anything active or competitive has helped you? Um. In terms of focus, it's helped me develop a good focus and determination, challenge myself. There was one point um, around, I think I was around 18 years old, and like a lot of my friends just left Thailand. Like, like it was like, it was like within one year, like my closest friends, because that's another thing about Thailand. A lot of people just come and go, so a lot just left, and I was like, wow, I'm alone now, you know. So then that's again, I immersed myself into Muay Thai. And that's why I got more into fighting because I was like, well, this is not going to leave me. So that's, yeah, it's, it's like I said, it's just been able to ground me a lot. And has but your... There is cons uh -huh. involved there. Yeah. <laughs> so what are some of those? Because those, those are the interesting things. Those are the things I got to prepare prepare for with my daughter. So um, well, feel free to shed some light. Um, 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 cons in Muay Thai as a female look current is like, 
I mean, it's, it's a lot of guys there, you know, they look at you like a piece of meat sometimes. And even in my status, like trying to get my fighters fights, I'd have promoters of certain events or owners of certain events, like try and like get with me. And then that's just annoying because obviously I'm trying to just do my job and it can affect, right, right. it can definitely have some effect. Yeah, it, so it sounds like that might, is it, would that be the case with just females in general with Muay Thai? Because it is a male dominated sport and I think females are now just starting to become more accepted as fighters and, and you know, people are seeing that as a, as a potential path to something better in life. Yeah. So would, would that be the case across the board or is it more so with, with like Luke Kung, Western featured women and... Maybe all women, I mean, yes. maybe all female. Yeah. That's something you have to look out for. So how, how has your perspective actually helped at the gym too? Like, obviously you have a good, uh, a good idea on what Westerners want as far as Muay Thai. And now you also understand the Thai side of it. So are you able to fill in the Thai trainers on, on what Westerners are looking for? Has it helped you build up your gym? In terms of training, training is absolutely fine. Like, uh, yeah, my trainers do a good job and the, and the Farangs are the, the, the guests. They love it. They love the training. But trying to get the trainers and fighters to do anything else apart from training Muay Thai is so difficult. Just cleaning the gym, you know, basic like chores. So difficult. I can't even explain. <laughs> like I have to go in and clean the gym sometimes myself because like uh -huh. they're just like they're so lazy. Yeah. So that's some difficulties. But the training is good. <laughs> like I, yeah, I know, yeah. and I go in and I, I talk with the foreign guests as well, and which is important. You need to have some like customer build some rapport with the, your customers and talk to them, and also know what they want as well because everyone is different. But um, yeah, yeah, the training yeah. is good. Yeah, because I, I, you know, at least up until like maybe about 10 years ago, I felt like there was a, a big gap. When you go to a gym, a lot of the Thai gyms, they weren't really uh, used to training foreigners yet, or Westerners, I should say. Right. So, so they didn't know. They didn't know like, okay, sometimes the Westerners, they don't want people smoking where they're hitting the bag. You know, it's just a, it's a very different environment from back home where it's like, wait, we're in the gym and you're smoking a cigarette next to me. And so I imagine now with a lot more uh, Westerners or even like yourself, being able to kind of share the, what the Westerners are looking for, it's going to help the sport and the gyms grow, become a little bit more established in Thailand, uh, I guess viewed uh, as a little bit more, you know, I don't want to say professional, but just not a concrete camp in the middle of Bangkok, you know, as a place that actually you can go and get, you know, health and fitness and stuff like that. Yeah, I think it also helps, like, from the age of the trainer. If you have, like, a younger trainer, they're more open to things, whereas you have an older trainer, they're quite stubborn. Because everything's very traditional, every, the way they do everything, you have to do the very long run, you, everything's very like long duration, right. you know, so yeah, it, it does, that does uh, have an effect, the, the age of the trainer. So now are you, are you, do you feel like you're immersed in Thai society at all now? Not, not just like from the Muay Thai perspective or, or being a Luke Krung and having that, those friends, but as far as like hard, you know, just Thai society, do you feel like you are, you're a part of Thai society now? I'm a part of it to the extent of what I want to be. I mean, like, there's some things that I don't agree with, uh, some things that I don't feel is like me, so I won't go there. I just kind of, I know like my place, you know? Um, but yeah, I am, uh, it took me a while to, to kind of understand myself as well. Because once I got into Muay Thai, I became too Thai at one point. I became too Thai and I was like- Can, can you explain? So, so in your perspective, what is, what is too Thai? I don't, like, just, oh. Is it eating, eating too much sometime after training, or, or what is it? Yeah, maybe so much sometime, <laughs> and just like, uh, you know, like how they can, they can be very humble, and but, I mean, which is also a good thing. But then I kind of just lost my own spark, you know. Uh, just to take order. I mean, because I was I was a fighter as well, so I became like a fighter. I just kind of took orders and just did my thing, and didn't really. I just lost my own personality for a, for a while. So right, then right. that's when I, I went to America after that for a year <laughs> to like find myself again. And yeah, you, you became a rebel. You probably rebelled. Yeah, yeah. So after, after I came back from the States, um, a little bit more westernized, came back and just became myself again. Yeah, I know. I got a little, a little bit brainwashed in there for a while. Like, oh, and also the spirituality. Yeah, everything was a bit too much with the spirituality. Like, um, you have so many things that you can't do are superstitious you know uh -huh. yeah that's that's uh, another thing I, I know we have some in the west but i don't think we we don't follow it as 
stringent as ties do, right? It's more of like kind of like a little side joke. Yeah. But here, here it's like, no, don't whistle in the kitchen because you're gonna marry an old ugly man or something, right? It's like, <laughs> like all these crazy things and. Yeah. So I got too much into that, and I was like, yeah, what's yeah. that wrong with me? Like, all, like I kept you know believing in ghosts, like so many things. Like it's just too much. All the spirits are in the air, and just I don't know. I think yeah. I, I even got like told off like the way I poured water was like backwards or something, and that was a bad thing. Yeah, and you you talked to me for just a couple of minutes ago about uh about the hierarchy at the gyms, right? Where it's like, you're a fighter, you do this, you're told this, this is what you do. And it kind of trickles. It's probably just kind of like a, you know, it's a, pretty much the rest of society as well, right? Like a lot of people wait around to be wait, you know, to be told what to do. Yes. And and I used to, you know, I, I disagreed with a lot of that because I always said, I want to raise two strong women. I don't want them to just become like, okay, yes, yes, yes. And I'll do it, I'll do this. Like mm-hmm. some, some disobedience is okay, right? But yeah. when COVID came around, I felt like, wow, okay, because ties are so used to be being told, do this, do that. That probably helped the numbers stay so low because everybody's like, you know, used to wearing the masks, used to doing what they're told, right? The government said, do this. Everyone did it. But you look back home or back to where I'm from in the States, it's like everybody wants to rebel. And then now it's just this mess over here, right? So in some cases, I think it's okay to have that, to have that mentality, right? But, but for most of the part, it's probably, if you want to develop yourself, it's probably not the best thing to do, right? That's very true. Yeah, I think that definitely has helped to control the situation over here in Thailand. But yes, it's authoritative, like how it is in, not just in the Muay Thai gyms, but in the school. So from a very young age, they're told it's like this and there's no question about that. And that's not a good thing because that stops a person from thinking, you know, they should, even if they think of something wrong, at least they thought of something different, you know, and they want to like maybe debate that. So I think yeah it's good and bad right right and uh, i'm assuming that you didn't have that experience at at some place like bangkok patana there no. was dialogue between the teachers and the students and yeah yeah so yeah in thailand i actually saw one one school i visited because i used to teach english and the kids were cr- actually crawling on their hands and knees to the student or to the teacher and it was a half thai what do you call it like bilingual school where they taught thai and english courses you know yeah but the the teacher was the westerner and uh, when the kids left the room, I was like, are you okay with this? Like, they just crawled over to you on your hands and knees. And he's like, yeah, I'm just used to it by now. But I'm like, I don't think I want to teach here. This is a little bit too much for me. You know, yeah. I was just, and, and I couldn't imagine putting my kids through something like that. It's true. Where they have to crawl to somebody on their hands and knees. And there's a thing about, like, washing the parents' feet. That's a big, like, respectful thing. Like, if I was to go and, like, wash the feet of my dad. Like, it would be so respectful, right. and he'd, like, love that. But I'm like, no, I don't want to touch your feet. <laughs> yeah, if you tell that to somebody back home, they would be like, eh. I'll get, I'll get you a bucket of water and, some, and, you know, soak them in some soap or something. Yeah. So, yeah, there's lots of strange things, actually, in the culture. Like, so different in the West. Mm. So, so now that you've settled in here, like, what are your goals moving forward? Do you have any goals for the gym or for yourself? that you want to accomplish here in Thailand? Well, I'm, I'm studying uh, psychology right now for a master's degree, and I'm maybe hoping to do something into that, and, like branch out, because I feel like with the gym and what I, in my little Muay Thai world right now, I've kind of got, I've peaked. I'm, I'm not going anywhere now. I've, I've, I've done what I can do. I've learned as much as I can, and I'm not really going anywhere, going anywhere or developing myself. So that's why I decided to study and hopefully or maybe I'll do something else. Yeah. So, that, so in the in the line of psychology, would you do that in Thailand or would you go back to the West? I love living in Thailand. So maybe here, but if I can't get a job, then we'll see what happens. I just, England's so cold and miserable. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but I do miss like some of the stuff in England, like the mindset of the people and English culture can be quite nice as well. Yeah, sometimes I do miss that. Yeah. Because it seems like probably mental health could use a boost here in Thailand as well, right? Like if you go into, I'm sure there's a lot of people that, that would probably need like a psychologist or a psychiatrist or something like that. But it's still, it's a little bit taboo to go to somebody like that for help, right? Exactly. Yeah, it's still taboo here, um, which is a shame because suicide obviously is quite high. The numbers are quite high in Thailand. You've seen over the COVID situation, like the numbers have risen. Um, but Thai people, they're afraid of confrontation 
and that's no matter if like, they're angry or whatever like they're not, they're not going to express their feelings they'll just keep everything in and maybe drink drink away their sorrows but that can only build up right and that's why yeah it's not a good thing they need to know how to talk to people that's another thing i i, I want to like touch on is like within the family dynamics you don't really see that either you don't really see like it's a, a supportive family so much in Thailand. Like it depends on the hierarchy and the level of the people. But say, okay, so we'll start at the bottom, like a, a lower socio socioeconomic like status family. They just have children, and they'll give the child to their mother, the grandmother or whatever, to look after, and then the, the actual parent won't really look after them. So that kid is growing up without any like mental support or support from the, you know someone who can really teach them and guide them throughout life. So that's like the low, and that's very common. Then the middle class, I think the middle class is more so supportive. I, th I, th I think they stay home more with the with the kids and they're more interactive. So I think uh, in terms of support, like the com communication, I think that is there more in middle class. Higher class families, it's all about business. So uh, even the marriage is a business transaction for a lot of it, you know, like, a rich family will just marry with a rich family and then they'll have a kid who can look after their business in the future and that's what they care about so again the support is not so much there so you i think that really reflects in the people you see that they don't really value the relationship so much right and do, do you think that people in the uh the lower classes do you think they have more kids because there's that chance that one of those kids are going to be on be able to take care of them in the future like i don't know somebody told me like if the more kids you have the better the chance that those one of those kids at least will be able to take care of the parent later on down the road. I don't know if there's any truth to that. No, I think they just pop out kids. No, they just. <laughs> I think the, there's not really a sex education in the schools. Uh -huh. uh, they're not really taught about contraceptives or whatever. So they just, yeah, pop them out. So, so you know, the, the whole thing about mental health, like why is it such a stigma to talk about these things? I, I You know, because Westerners, they come here, and they could see what's happening, but they don't understand the reasons why these things happen happened. I'm sure it's been over, you know, maybe hundreds of years that, that it's like this. But but why is it such a stigma to talk about mental health or these other things that you're bringing up? Um, in Thailand, they just see it as you're crazy, basically. Yeah. Just. Bullshit. Bullshit. Yeah. Yeah. Just as simple as that. Just simple pull it down to craziness. Yeah. You look like I don't think there's a word, but just like just you know. Like a, a minor mental health problem. It's just the the word is lokjit, which is like disease of the of the mind. So, which is crazy. And do you see it progressing at all? It with is the, with the younger generations, or slowly. Yes, I think so. Yeah, it's funny. My my friend had a baby. They had a daughter together with his Thai wife, and the first thing his wife wanted to do was send the baby with her mom. And, and he was like, hold on, hold on. He's like, what's wrong with me? You know, I'm the father. I, I could take care of my baby, you know. And she was having a hard time understanding, like, why are we going to raise the baby when, when we can go out and work and make money? And, and you know, my, my grandma or, you know, the baby's grandmother would do it somewhere up country. Yeah. But, you know, he, he put his foot down. He's like, no, 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 this is it's my baby. I'm going to help raise the baby. And, they, you know, they worked it out. But Good. it's, uh, yeah, it's, you know, looking at it from the outside, we have this idea that that family is very important in Thailand, right? Like, it's all about the family and respecting your elders. But then when you come here and you stay here for a while, you kind of see this other side to it yeah, where definitely. that might not always be the case, right? Yeah, a lot of the time the parents are very uninvolved. So yeah, it's right. strange, right? You have to like, you really have to thank them for giving you this life and respect them, but yet they don't, they're not involved in your life apart from just the, the initial stage. Right. And sending money, yeah. So did you ever, yeah, did you ever feel like you, you weren't doing enough for your parents? Like you, you know, you grew up in the West, so you probably had the Western mindset. And then when you move to Thailand, you feel a lot of pressure to do things for your for your parents, right? Like, did you feel any of that pressure when you moved here? Um, like my dad's family, they'll be like, "Don't get mad at your dad," or like, "Don't like talk badly to your dad." Or people would say that. I'm like, "Yeah, but I mean, if if there's something to raise, if there's something to talk about, yeah, I want to raise that topic and talk about it." And sometimes I can come across kind of direct and strong, but that's just my personality. I can't, I can't right, control. Right. <laughs> Like he just wants me to be like, oh, pa, sorry, you know, like you know, they're very, very like uh, submissive in a way. I can't do that. It's not my personality. Yeah, yeah. I, I try that with my daughters, and they just laugh at me. I'm like, you, you have to lie to me. You have to lie to me and say, you know, 
cop con cop something and, I'm, and they're just like laughing me like no we're not i'm not doing that to my american dad yeah well i mean to with my mom who's british like we're friends i can sit and talk to her about anything and it's so nice to have that to have a parent who's a friend as well and uh, I, i really value that yeah okay so I'm gonna, i'm gonna put you on the spot with this question if if you can give any advice, I'm going to be selfish, a little bit selfish with this question, but if you can give any advice to my two Luke Kung daughters uh, as far as their life and what to expect or anything in Thailand, what would you tell them? <laughs> There's so much. I mean, of course, the, like looks are not everything. That's one thing. But then again, you say that to them and other people, external people will be saying, oh, you're not like this, you're like this, you know, like people are going to be finding fingers. So you have to prepare for that and just, they have to be confident in themselves enough to just like not give a shit about what people say. Because that's a very Thai thing is to just point fingers and say stuff to you. All right, there it is. Sports, yeah. sports, do sports, yeah. anything, anything. But yeah, it will help. Because also when you do a sport, it, it, it gives you a group as well. It gives you a social group. So you don't have to belong to the West or the East. You know, you can just belong to whatever sport you're doing, dancing or whatever you want to do. Right. Okay. All right. So I'm going to, I'm going to play this for them in about 10 years and uh, we'll see how that goes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So is there, is there anything that you want to let the Muay Thai community know? Any projects that you're working on? Anything that they should be tuning in for? Right now, no, because I mean, we had to cancel our championships, we had to cancel everything this year, right? So um, in terms of Muay Thai, there's not really anything happening. It's kind of sad, actually, like the, the way that Muay Thai is <clears throat> going right now. I feel like um, they're not getting as much support and I feel like the West is kind of coming up more than Thailand. Because like, yes, like say in the States, they've been, they're going to invest in the sport endorsements, sponsorships, everything, they'll invest in, in it. But in Thailand, not so much. Again, like uh, the traditional mindset of the fighters as well, or the, the Thai mindset where they're just very sabai sabai, they don't care as much, which is a shame. Like if you do a Western person, like they're on it with nutrition and they're focusing training and that's all they're caring and thinking about. Whereas a Thai fighter would be eating crap, snacks, you know, Cupcakes, yeah. Yeah, I'm playing video games like, all night and stuff, and yeah, it's uh, I don't know, it's changing. Yeah, yeah, I noticed that uh, at one gym I used to go to. I remember we were running around the block, and the, the fighters stopped to eat hot dogs during their run, and then the one of them they had a chocolate cupcake, and I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, wait, we're about to train in about 30 minutes, and this guy is scarfing down this cupcake. Yeah. And you know, you, you pick up a Muay Thai book off of Amazon, it's like, oh, the, the fighters they eat fruits and vegetables and and fish and everything. And, you know, they do a little bit, but, uh, yeah, it's very different from the reality of, of what you see. So much junk food. And they like that Nam Deng, the red, the red syrup liquid drink. Uh, it's yeah. so healthy. It's just pure sugar. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what, what would it take to change where Muay Thai is now? You know, because I, I know it's kind of taboo to talk about, but I think for the sport to grow, that things do have to change, right? And I always had this idea of, like, why doesn't the government have some sort of program to teach the fighters about financial responsibility so that they're not stuck at the end of their careers. They actually know how to put a percentage away for, for, for a house or for, for a piece of land. You know, some fighters, they do do that, but for the majority of them, they get stuck in a cycle and then they, they turn to drugs and alcohol and stuff like that. But do you, do you know any uh, programs that maybe the Sports Authority of Thailand would set up or the Thai government to help the fighters? Um, <clears throat> sorry, they're too corrupt to care, which is sad but it's politics and I don't know if anyone will actually care so much that they'll actually bother to help them which is sad yeah yeah because I've, 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 I've had this type of conversation before and a lot of people do want to help but it's usually the westerners who want to help or like the international ties who want to help but you can't because the people who are in power are like the very traditional people they're old school and they, they don't bother about that Right. Yeah, that's funny. It's, it usually is Westerners that want to help. And I don't know if it's that, you know, that that always that Western ideal of like you want to go and save some place that needs to be saved. But I think when people come here, they take to Muay Thai, they take to the culture, they take to the people so much that you, you want to see them grow. You want to see them progress. You don't want to see the kid sleeping under the boxing ring for the rest of his life or, or you know, his dad is an alcoholic and he has to hold pads and, and he has his teeth knocked out from, you know, being drunk on the pads. And, you know, people don't want to see that. But 
you know, what, what, what is, you know, what are the other, like, what do you do as a Westerner? Like, where can you even go to start making some sort of change or to get involved in a sport here in Thailand? I mean, I think you've seen a few gyms who've done this. They've just kind of created their own gym, which is owned by a Westerner. And they've kind of just made it their own sort of like environment. And yes, maybe they'll have a couple of ties, but not that many, you know, and they'll just do everything as Western as possible, just so they can kind of keep the standards higher and like be more stricter with the fighter. But usually these type of gyms would be would have contracts with like big fight promotions as well. So they have something to back them up. And then another another thing I heard like some people have spoke about is like um, video gaming is becoming very popular in Thailand. So a lot of the Thai youths are getting into video games and they can make more money playing video games than doing Muay Thai. So all these like village kids would rather just be playing I don't know, whatever, whatever game it is. And right. yeah, so so that's another thing I, I heard that could be affecting the sport in the future. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. It makes sense, especially uh, soccer or football, right? A lot of a lot of kids nowadays they, they kind of look up to the uh, to the football players, and they would probably rather go into that than say Muay Thai, yeah. where there's a uh, a lot less money to be made in the sport of Muay Thai. Yeah. So there's a, there's right. a, a lot of things affecting the sport right now. We'll yeah. see how it plays out in the future.